بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين نشهد أنه بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في الله حق جهاده حتى أتاه اليقين فصلوات الله وسلامه عليه ما تطوع مسك وفاح وما ترنم حمام وصاح وما هذا الغرغ ونح أما بعد عباد الله اعلموا أن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة كل بدعة ضلالة كل ضلالة في النار ثم ما بعد my dear brothers and sisters in Islam um, I was giving an hour to speak and talk and I'm not a, a talker I don't like talking for a very long time because I sincerely believe people do not pay attention past 30 minutes as a matter of fact that they say people's attention uh, attention so span is only from 9 to 10 minutes and that's why they're coming up with something they're changing everything because they say people cannot watch or listen to something for a very long time and they say now they're trying to compress their commercial into six seconds in six seconds they want to advertise a vehicle they want to advertise a house they want to advertise a drink only in six seconds so for me to stand here and speak for 60 minutes i think is a little bit overkilling so what i would do i would speak inshallah only for 30 minutes for those of you and so mashallah it's strange the topic it seems that is talking about me living in minority in a society where we're always always being the minority i came to the west as a young kid or as a young ch or as a child and we were living in a muslim minority or living in a non-muslim society as a minority and we face all the challenges we face all the difficulties. We face a lot of things that a lot of you are sitting here do not have clue about it. But today, Ibadullah, it seems that all Muslims, regardless of where they are, regardless what country that they're from, those who wants to hold on to the Sunnah of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and follow the right path are the minority wherever I travel wherever I go people of Sunnah people who wants to adhere to the Sunnah of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are considered to be minority and that is Sunnah Allah fi khalqi this is the Sunnah of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in this deen because as the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stated in a hadith qala bada al-islam gharibam wa fi hadith this hadith particular hadith he says Islam started being strange. Some of the ulama, they say it's an athar. They say it started as being strange. This deen of Islam started being strange. People did not accept it right away. People did not, you know, follow it right away. People were like, what is this new thing that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is calling people to? However, there would be a time that the sunnah of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will become a stranger than what it is today. If you ask and you look around the Muslim nations, you see countries like Saudi, countries like Somalia, countries like Sudan, countries like Libya, where Muslims are majority, or Muslims, the majority of the people are Muslims. However, following the sunnah of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is strange and the people of Ahl sunnah considered to be strangers so sometimes when I travel outside of Canada I feel that I'm still a stranger you know we're still living in a strange world people do not see how we see they don't see the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam how we see it and that's normal because according to hadith of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam hadith Thawban fi sunani Abi Dawood wa sahahu al-Albani 
يقول النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يوشك أن تداعى عليكم الأمم من كل أفق He said it's about that nations will come to you from every angle يقول في مسند أحمد قال من كل جانب أي من كل أفق from every angle of in your life of your life people will try to change Now look at the Muslims. We are the majority. Every five people, there's one Muslim. We have everything that we need to succeed. We own 73% of, you know, what we call al batrol oil in the world. We own, as the Muslims, we own 40% of natural gas. But yet, Ummah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not the strongest. That's why Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, يوشك أن تداعى عليكم الأمم من كل أفق كما تداعى الأكلة على أقصعتها. He said, nations will come and will feast on you. They will feast on you. Now, he said, as people will come and sit around the table and eat the meal, Now, if you analyze this hadith, when you're eating, does your food challenge you? Does a chicken that you, you know, you know, picking it up from the plate and taking it to your mouth, does that chicken struggle? Does the rice that you've just picked on the spoon, does that rice struggle and challenge you? No. So the messenger of Allah said, my ummah, you, O oh people, will become like that. People will come and will feast on you like that. And one of the Sahaba, radiyallahu anhu, who perhaps was one of the people who witnessed or learned about the battle of Badr, who cannot comprehend, Ya Rasulullah, you know, we were weak, we were only 300 Sahabi, and we defeated the superpower of our time, we defeated the Quraysh, with over a thousand soldiers, with only 300 people. And now you're telling nation will come and they will feast on us. So he posed a question and said, Ya Rasulullah, awa min qillatin yawm Are we small in number on that day? Are we small in number? The messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qala la. بل أنتم يس rather you are so many ولكنكم غثاء كغثاء السيف. he said but you are like the foam on a water. you know when it rain and the spring or the streams bring the water from the high point and then it creates a stream and that stream has water that's flowing on the top of that water. you will see you will see bubbles, brown bubbles, dusty bubbles. And clean bubbles. This is a ghutha. And when the water moves left, the ghutha they go left. And the water moves right, the ghutha go right. And when the water goes straight, the ghutha goes straight. He said, "You, my ummah, ummah Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you would be like this." Now understand, my dear brothers, when the messenger of Allah said, "Min kulli ufuq from every angle." Literally, it means from every angle. Even Muslim countries right now, you cannot be a Muslim. You cannot practice your deen in a Muslim country the way you want to practice. I'm from Somalia. In Somalia, look, we don't produce weapons. We don't manufacture vehicles. We don't build airplanes. We don't hardly do anything. We are a simple nation. Then why all every enemies of Islam, why did they try to destroy that simple nation? Do you know why? Because that simple nation decided to follow the true Islam. Yes, in their little village, you know, no electricity, not much of civilization. They want to follow Islam in their village. But the outside worlds did not allow us. Why? Because 
they don't allow true Islam to manifest itself. Messenger of Allah said, Min kullu ufiq, from every angle. Do you think in Muslim countries nowadays, even though we are the majority, mashallah, do you think our children are taught the right Islam? No. No, we're not. Wallahi, in a university, one of the universities that I was, I still remember Sheikh Waqi Allah is a Sudanese Sheikh. You know, I'm in this university and I'm studying Islamic studies. I'm studying Qala Allah wa Qala Rasul. I'm studying Hadith. I'm studying Sahih al Bukhari. And then I walk into the library of the university and Sheikh Waqi Allah is sitting and I can see he's sad. And I sat next to me, he's a Sudanese sheikh. You know, Sudan is a very simple, very nice people. And I said, yeah, sheikh, what's wrong with you? Why, why are you gloomy? And then he gave me a booklet. He gave me a, a booklet and he said, Sheikh Saeed, read. And I read. And it says, ayat, verses from the Quran that must cha be changed. Tafsir of ayat that must be changed. And I looked and every ayah that has something to do with following Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, following uh, Wahdat al-Islam, the unity of Islam, fighting and struggling for yourself, understanding every ayat, they say the tafsir of those ayat have to be changed. So the messenger of Allah said, Min kulli ufuq, even our children are not allowed to be taught what they should be taught in their deen. So when you talk about minority in a non-Muslim environment, I would say that challenge is everywhere. It's in Somalia, it's in Sudan, it's in Libya, it's in Bahrain, it's everywhere. But let me tell you some of the struggles that we face as a minority. See, when you're a minority, there are pros and cons. There are positives and there are negatives. When you're in minority, first you try to unite. You're from Pakistan, you're from, you know, you know, from Somalia, you're from you know, Palestine. You try to be together, one ummah. And you try to follow the sunnah of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you say, Al-Muslimu akhul Muslim, kan fi hadith sahih. Al-Muslimu akhul Muslim. And we try to be together in one small community. And the positive also being in minority. Because of we minority, we try always to meet one another. We used to try. See, when I went to Canada, when I got to Canada, I landed on the city called Toronto. Most of you know the city of Toronto. And then I decided to move to a small village. Only 40,000 people used to live in that village. I was the only black person, by the way. Everybody else was white. Everyone else was white. During the break time, in, I was in high school, grade nine. I just started my high school. When I sit in the cafeteria, all white kids used to come to me and say, where are you from? I say, from Africa. And you know, the next day he say, uh, you know, can I touch you? He said, yeah, you can touch me. You know, he thinks that if he touch me, he's gonna be black as well, you know. And then, can I touch your hair? Yeah, you can touch my hair, you know. So I live, but subhanAllah, surely after that, then the Muslims start moving slowly, but surely. And we used to be together. We used to be united. You know, the Pakistani used to come to us. The Bengali would come. The Indians would come. They forgot their political issues in, between India and Pakistan. The Somalis, they used to come together. We forgot everything that happened, was happening in Somalia, you know, and we became a little community. That was the beauty of being a minority. And we had one little musallah. And in that musallah, we used to come together, pray behind the imam, you know, whether he is from Somalia or from Sudan. And we, we never had issues. This is a Shafi'i, he's a Hanafi. He's Maliki, he's Hanbali, you know, he is no Madhabi, La Madhabi. We didn't care. We used to pray together, mashallah, tabarakallah. 
That was the beauty of being in minority. And our sisters, I remember, our sisters, when, when we finished, we used to have a little halaq, we used to have a little sheikh, and the sheikh only used to teach us how to recite the Quran. And when we finished, we used to make sure the sisters are safe. We used to walk, you know, they, we, and take them to the bus station. Make sure they get to the bus, they get on the bus and they, you know, are at home. And sometimes we used to go with them if it's late. That was love. That was, there was, that, that time we had brotherhood, sisterhood in Islam, al-mahabba. That was some of the beauty of living in minority. And when every time that we were faced issues in, in, in a larger scale, we used to come together. I don't know if you remember, in Canada, we never, most of the Muslims used, never used to vote. You know, he's from Canada, we never used to vote. You know, because we say, we're Muslims, you know, let these non-Muslims do what they need to do until this man became our prime minister. Stephen Harper, if you remember. Harper, he had one issue, and that is Islam and Muslims. So he made our lives so difficult. He made so difficult. If you want to establish a masjid, it's difficult. If you want to invite his speakers from outside of Canada, difficult. He just became, he was a, he was a, a different version of Trump. He was a different version of, you know, Donald Trump. Then the Muslims decided, because he did something that's so strange. There was a Muslim who wanted to become a Canadian. She wanted to become a Canadian citizen. But she used to wear niqab. So the judge asked her to remove her niqab. And said, today we're going to swear you as a, as a Canadian, you know, and you're going to become a Canadian, but remove, remove the niqab. The young lady, she said, no, I'm not moving my niqab. Then the judge said, then I will not grant you the Canadian citizenship. If you want to become Canadian, you got to be like Canadian, the rest of Canadians. So this young lady, she challenged the judge and she won the case. When she won the case, who came to the picture? The prime minister. The prime minister decided he's going to challenge this young lady. And he challenged that young lady. And she won over him. Then the Muslim says, wait, wait a second. If the prime minister is coming down to niqab level, and he wants to dictate what we should wear as a Canadian Muslims, what should we do? Let us vote this man out. So 79% of the Canadian Muslims start voting. And then we voted him out. And who became our, Cana who, our, who became our Prime Minister? Trudeau. And the first lecture, the first live TV interview that he gave, he said Muslims are the one who's been terrorized. Muslims are the victims. They not the criminals, and we should leave Muslim Canadians be Muslim Canadians. Just because the Muslim minority decided to come together, we were able to change the Prime Minister of Canada, the Ibnillah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is some of the benefit of being minority. We don't have parties. We don't have this party, political party, and that political party, but we have something called Muslim community. These are some of the benefits of being minority. However, when we start growing as a community, then we imported our illnesses from back home. And then we start living Islam based on race. And we start establishing masajids based on race. So we have Pakistani masajids, we have Afghani masajids, we have Bosnian masajids, we don't have in, in Malaysian masajids, but alhamdulillah, you know. But we have Somali masajids, we have Turkish masajids. 
And not only that, because we started growing in the city of Toronto, we became over 600,000 Muslims, then we start having this other diseases, such as, oh, he's from that madhab, he's from that group, he follows this imam, and then we start segregating each other. And this is something as a Muslim nation, we must learn to overcome. Especially if we are living as a minority. We must learn to overcome that. And we must learn to unite. Remember, I know you're not minority here, but remember when the Sahaba of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came to the city of Medina, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came to Medina, and they were the minority. What did the Messenger of Allah do? What did he do? The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he brought everyone together. He brought the Yahud, he brought the non-Muslim Arabs, he brought the Muhajirin, he brought the Ansar, and he said, all of us, let us have a common goal, and that is to protect the city of Medina from outside enemies. If the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was able to have common ground with the, those non-Muslims for the greater benefit, then I think as a Muslim minority outside of Muslim world, we can come together for a common ground and serve the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. See, in the West, I live in the West, I live in Canada, and Canada is one of the best countries in the West, in my views. Better than living in a lot of Muslim countries because in Canada I have freedom of speech. In Canada I can practice my religion. In Canada my wife can wear niqab as she desires. But I know some Muslim country I cannot speak. In Muslim country my wife cannot wear her niqab. In Muslim country at uh, the time after salah, 10 minutes after salah, everybody have to leave the masjid. But in Canada, I can leave my masjid open till midnight. In Canada, we have a system that is in place for everyone. And that is, you can practice your religion, you can practice your freedom, you can be whatever you want to be, as long as you're not harming anyone else. Unfortunately, Muslims, they do not understand that. Muslims, they think we have to be together. Pakistani, only Pakistan. Somalis, only pa Somalis. And they don't understand the importance of unity. Whatever we are, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, as long as some of the ulama use it, as long as the person is from Ahl al-Qibla, we have to find a common ground where can we work together as minority. Ahl al-Sunnah wal jamaah as I said, those who are following the sunnah of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wherever they go, nowadays they are the minority. If you go to Somalia, now Ahl al-Sunnah are minority. If you go to Saudi, now you will see Ahl al-Sunnah, they're getting smaller and smaller. If you go to Egypt, same word, everywhere. Those who want to hold to the sunnah of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, struggle is coming, my dear brothers and sisters. The struggle is coming. The days of the ulama of the past that we used to shelter ourselves behind them, today we are exposed. Today we are open for everybody to criticize, to take a shot on us. So what we need to do, we need to think how can we bring everybody closer as Abdullah ibn Mubarak used to say, مِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ تَنْغَمِزْ حَسَنَاتٍ فِي بَحْرِ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ وَمِنْهُ مَنْ تَنْغَمِزْ سَيِّئَاتٍ فِي بَحْرِ حَسَنَاتِهِمْ So he says, some people, the evil overshadows their goodness. And some people, their goodness overshadows their evil. So if you have good people in your community, bring them in. Bring them closer. Win them over. Now as Ahl al-Sunnah, it's time that we all should go out Bring everybody to the Masajid. Now look, look, people now, not in the Masajid, I don't know about this country, but in my country, in Canada, people, they only come to the Masjid the day of Eid and the day of Jummah. 
Do you have the same problems here? Do you read? You see people from every part of the city. You see people that you never knew they were Muslims. The day of Jum'ah is the same thing. But what happened to the rest of the year? They're not there. You and I, like Brother Said, coming here and talking to you, it's beautiful. I love talking to you. I love seeing you. It's beautiful. But we should go out there and give da'wah to those people and bring them in. Bring them in to the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My dear brothers and sisters, I'm glad that you don't live in minority uh, country, alhamdulillah. But if you ever come to a country where the Muslims are minority, in the West, there are challenges that I mentioned, but there are also good points, as I mentioned. And I think the goodness over there outweighs the negative aspect of living minority. We're better than people in China who are not allowed to fast, who are not allowed to practice their deen, who are not allowed to pray in public, who are not allowed to show Islamic, you know, dress code. We, in Canada, we're enjoying the ni'mah of Allah. This is how I dress in Canada, by the way. I don't wear jeans and baseball cap. This is how I travel in Canada. And everybody, everybody respects that because they call us the holy men. You know, he's a holy, he's a holy man, mashallah. So we don't have, you know, they don't discriminate us. They don't, you know, you know uh, corner us. But they respect us as Muslim minority. As sometimes the biggest challenge in the Muslim minority comes from the Muslims themselves. Comes from the Muslims themselves. There's a man, subhanAllah, there's an organization in Canada you ever come across called Canadian Muslim Congress. It's a big name, am I right? Don't worry, I can talk about Canada. You guys are not getting in trouble if I talk about Canada. Called Canadian uh, Muslim Congress. The only thing that they do is to fight Muslims. That's all they do. They write to the Congress, they write to the Prime Minister, and they say, we want you to ban niqab. We want you to ban Islamic outfit. We want you to close the masajid. These masajid are funded by, you know, this group and that group. We want, this is their job. And they call themselves Muslims. We also have those, but the majority of the Muslims are decent Muslims. One of the good things in being, in being minority in a Muslim, in Muslim country is, we, able, we are able to decide the fate of our children. See, I know some of you, you say, well, education system in Canada is not the best. By the way, I may agree or disagree here. But you, we also have, we have some schools. In my masjid, Sakina Center, <coughs> in a radius of, of 10 kilometers, we have... In 10 kilometers, we have 15 Islam schools. 15 Islam schools. Different levels, you know, primary, high school. We have 15 Islam schools. And the government would not force it. As a matter of fact, in a place is called, you know, Alberta, not Quebec, but like uh, different cities, different parts. The government subsidizes the Islam schools. And sometimes 100%. The teachers, the teachers will receive 100% salary like a public teachers, public school teachers, while they're teaching in Islamic schools. Some of them, they give 80%. All the tuition. See, your child in Canada can come and learn Quran, learn Hadith, study the seat of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As long as he's learning English, math, Three subjects, math, English, and science. Then the government, certain parts of Canada, that school is fully subsidized. Which means everything that the school needs financially, the government would pay for it. I, can't, I cannot find that in a Muslim country in a lot of times. I can't. So there's a lot of blessings living in, in, in a non-Muslim environment, being a minority. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to... 
protect us and protect the deen of our children. The last point that I want to mention, and this is sad, but every time that we move to an environment that is not 100% Islam, you will always find casualties. You will always find people who are deviating from the deen of Allah. At this point, and I do travel extensively through Europe, um, North America, we are facing one problem. I don't know if you have that. And that is almost 30% of young, educated Muslims are leaving Islam. That's 30%. Young, educated Muslims. Not, you know, criminals. We have criminals, alhamdulillah, mashallah. As we have hafad, we have also criminals. You know, ummah, we have everything, mashallah. But the, the kids who went to university and gained education, Western education, or what we call Western education, 30% of them are leaving Islam. Now, that's the biggest challenge that we have in the West as minority. Because we can teach our children Islam in you know, high school, up to high school, but as soon as they go to public school, to universities, we don't have Islamic universities, so as soon as they reach there, a lot of them, they get confused, they get brainwashed, and they come back and they question Islam. 30% question Islam. And they say, why Islam? Why do I have to follow Islam? And they leave Islam. Until today, we still don't have way of countering that issue. We don't. See, as a young child, two things usually controls you and creates boundaries around you. One is your deen. Two is your culture. It's your culture. A lot of people undermine culture. You know, see, in, in Somalia, for example, you know, we have deen. If the deen is not the one that is controlling you and putting you in your place, then your culture will put you in your place. But when you live in minority, in that Muslim environment, and the deen is not there, definitely culture is not there. So we lost a lot of young people to the ideology that God does not exist. Some of them, they say, God exists. There's a being there. There's something created this universe, but I, I'm still searching. But what happened to the Islam that you taught? What happened to the Quran that you were taught? What happened to the Sunnah of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? said, well, now I have my own mind and I was taught to think with open mind. So we ask you to make dua for our young people. Same thing that we face in Canada, in the state, United, States, United States of America, Sweden, Denmark, UK. It's the same problem. Same problem. Young people leaving Islam. And a lot of times, I don't know who I was telling last night, a lot of times we're very happy when one person accepts Islam. And we embrace that person. And if that person is white, Allahu Akbar, mashallah, tabarakallah. You know, Especially over there, why is MashaAllah Muhammad again walking on earth? But what happened? One person comes, but we're losing 30%. See, we have one per people coming, few of them coming to Islam, but we're losing larger crowd. So we ask you in this Muslim country to make dua for us and for our children because it's a challenge that we're facing. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your dua and your effort. Wa salam alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Now we would like to open questions to the floor. Before the questions come, there was, uh, as we know, Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah. He's a great scholar, Imam of the Imam al-Fiqh. 
And he had a student by the name Abdullah ibn Mubarak. Abdullah ibn Mubarak, rahimahullah, was a muhaddith. Abu Hanifa was more faqih, but Abdullah ibn Mubarak was more muhaddith. Both of them great scholars. And while Abdullah ibn Mubarak sitting next to Abu Hanifa, somebody posed a question to Abdullah ibn Mubarak. And Abdullah ibn Mubarak, he said, Nuhina an tekalam inda akabirina. He said, we were taught not to speak in the presence of our scholars. So it would be very shameful for me to answer questions when you have the Sheikh, Sheikh Hussein Yee right here. It would be very, you know, uh, not the best of adab. So I will request all the questions, questions to be posed to the Sheikh instead of me, unless it has something to do with Canada, inshallah. Other than that, the Sheikh will handle the questions, inshallah. I will filter the question, inshallah. Zakallah, Hadda. Question from the brothers first? Or the sisters? Okay. Any question from the sisters? Brothers first, okay. Walaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Pass the mic, please pass the mic. Assalamu alaikum sir. Wa salam wa rahmatullah. You mentioned just now in Saudi, the Sun, Sunni Sunnah getting smaller in the Sorry, minority. Sir. Saudi. Mm -hmm. Saudi. Yeah. More people are fighting Sunnah. This is also facing some challenges. So. No, I said, even in Saudi, the people who are Upon the Sunnah, you know, getting smaller and smaller. That's what I said. Not challenge, getting smaller and smaller. Yeah, it be 100% Sunnah then. It should be 100% Sunnah. It's not easy. 100%. Maybe it should be 100% Sunnah. Maybe they will, they will have the feeling that Saudi should be practicing 100%. They should be. We all should be practicing Sunnah of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 100%. Now let me ask you another question. Um, I'll ask you a question. By the way, the only country that I know of, maybe Sheikh Hussein can correct me, uh, that 100% Sunni, 100% uh, Muslim, which country is that? Sorry? Okay. Saudi? No, Saudi, they have uh, Shia, they have uh, Yahud, they have Najran, Nasara, they have all those. Somalia is the only country. I'm purposely saying that because I'm Somali, I'm, you know. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Shaykh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This question for Sheikh Saeed is regarding Canada. So when you're mentioning the Muslims were united and together, I was like, which country is he talking about? Because I'm also born and raised in Canada. And then, then you later on said that the division, the Turkish mosques, okay, now I know what he's talking about. Because your gener the generation that I'm born uh, and you were in Canada. I didn't know it was united like that. I was so surprised when you were mentioning that because I spent all my life in Canada and all I've seen is uh, there's a lot of infighting and uh, politics and the masjids and the, the, especially the Pakistanis, the Indians don't like the Arabs and everything. So from your experience and your wisdom living in Canada for so long, what do you see in the next 10 years with the Muslim community? How are this, where is it trending? If I tell you the history of Muslims in Canada, you would be shocked to know that the first two Muslim families that ever came to Canada, they were from Scotland. They were not Arabs, they were not Pakistanis, they were two white families who accepted Islam in Scotland and they moved to Canada in 1835. They were the first people and they kept Islam for almost 100 years, they kept, they kept the deen and identifying themselves as a Muslim for 100 years. Later on, then the Bosnians uh, came to Canada. And they established a little mosque in, in, in the city of Toronto or Musalla. And for your information, the first message that was built in Canada was built in 1936 in the city of Edmonton 
by the name Masjid, by the name Ar Rashid, Islamic Center. That was the actual Masjid that was built as a Masjid in Canada. The first people who came to Canada uh, from the Middle East, they were Syrians and Lebanese. And those, they were, you know, if, I don't know if you ever met Syrians and Lebanese, they're very light skinned and some of them do have blue eyes. What happens when they came, they came around 1900, the beginning of 19, 1905. The first grave that we witnessed was, or the first person that was buried, according to our record, was buried in 1901. And he was, you know, from that country, from Syria. But what happened with that generation, that generation, they integrated to, into the society. And the children left Islam, the Syrian children, the Lebanese children, mainly Syrians. And I went to a village uh, by the name Toronto, or Toronto. And this is not Toronto, it's another city. And in that city, almost 80% of the people in the city, originally they were from Syria. But none of them are Muslims. Subhanallah, none of them are Muslims. One of them, they built a mosque outside of the city and a graveyard for Muslims. And the key holder, the person who holds the key of the mosque and the masjid can only be open for Jum'ah and the rest of the week nobody goes, it's because it's outside of the city. We went to his house to say, you know, how is the condition of Muslims in the city? And then he informed us that he himself is not even a Muslim. His wife is not a Muslim. The family is not Muslim. But he holds the key. And he said to uh, the guy who, it was, uh, his name was Muhammad Yusuf. I still remember. That was a long time ago. And this guy, Muhammad Yusuf, was a reaver. And that brother, he felt so bad. And he cried when he saw the grandson of the man who found that masjid who is a non-Muslim, yet he holds the keys of the masjid. So Muhammad Yusuf, he got very emotional, and he stood up, I still remember, and he said, you are the grandson of that man. And then he started, you know, talking to him with emotions, and the man, he just got up, and he put his hand in his pocket, and he took the keys of the masjid, and he threw them at us, and he said, if you want to take care of your masjid, go and take care of it. I don't care about this. So I'm just telling you a little bit about the history of Muslims in Canada. And then it was only, you know, 60s when a lot of Lebanese came to a city called Edmonton and Calgary, which is the west part of Canada. And they also came to a city called London, Ontario. And they, that's also, uh, they built the second mosque in Canada in the city of London, Ontario. Then after that, in 70s, Pakistanis and Indians came. And the Pakistani Indians, they were good for, well, mashallah, for few, a lot of things. But one thing that they did well was establishing massage. So they established massage. We were all united. When we were small in number, we were united. When I came to Canada, you know, 80s, you know, late 80s, you can, 90s, you know, we had in the city of Toronto, we had few masjids. One of them being Jami'a Mosque. Jami'a Mosque in Canada, in the city of Toronto. Jami'a Mosque, and we all used to travel almost three hours sometimes just to come and pray in the masjid. Now, alhamdulillah, in the city of Toronto, we have over 110 masjids. Over 110 masjids, from you know, few masjids to hand. Now, it is normal when you have large people or large community for them to... Um, prefer to be there with their own kind. So the Pakistani, they start staying with the Pakistanis. Somalis, mashallah, tabarakallah. You know, we, 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 we also stay together. So Somalis are with Somalis, Lebanese with Lebanese, and so on. Yes, the fight happens. Yes, the, the division is there. But the khair is also there. You know, these people who are fighting over the masajid, most of the time, they really don't have much of Islamic knowledge. They don't have much ilm. Uh, you saw the division, but I saw other things. I saw that these people that we, who build the masajid, they were the ones who preserve Islam for us as a Canadian Muslims. They're the ones who established Islamic schools. They're the ones, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, six of my, all of my children, all six of them, 
Lillahi alham, they all went to Islamic schools because those people were built, they, they built it, they built Islamic schools and so on. So yes, there's a division or was a division, but that's only 10%. But the khair is there. The Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Is now in the city of Toronto, midnight, you drive, you will find halal restaurants, you will find massage that are open, you will find, you know, you, the next morning you will find schools for your children, you will find marakis of da'wah. Every corner in the city of Toronto, there's a center that's giving da'wah. There's young people on the street giving pamphlet to the Muslim, to the non-Muslims. In university, you have MSA, Muslim Student Association in the city of Toronto. University of Toronto, University of uh, York University, Ryerson, every college. Muslim students are so active. They're giving shahada here and there. Yes, but at the same time, we were faced the issue that I mentioned before, which is all Muslims are leaving Islam. And that is perhaps we as a teachers, we as a imams, we as parents, we fell to give these children what they needed as tools to preserve their deen. What we concentrated, especially Pakistani and Indians and Somalis, we are so into making, making sure that the child memorizes the Quran. I don't know if you have that issues here. You know, we have children, we have Hufar. Ramadan, the message is packed with Hufar. But if you ask them, can you give me the tafsir of Alam Tara Kaifa Fa'ala Rabbuka Bi Ashab Al Fil? They would not give you the tafsir of that. So maybe we should change the way we approach te you know, a methodology of teaching. And instead of just making them hafad, we should make them also understand the Quran, understand the message of Al Islam, understand this, the surah, surah of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if we do this, then these kids, when they reach the university level, they won't be able to be confused by other people. Allah no. Ala Wa Alam. I'm the only one talking. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Shaykh Sayyid. If one was uh, considering uh, participating in a migration program to Canada, me? Um, no, uh, from Malaysia, um, what would be the challenges, and is would you encourage that, or you know, um, what is expected from for someone who's coming from Malaysia and migrating over? My question would be why? Why would you do that? I mean, here I, I was the brothers were driving me around. I saw more ladies wearing hijab than those who are not wearing hijab. I've seen my Muslim brothers with beards, mashallah, I hear the adhan. Why would, I, why would I move from this country to where we are the minority of the minority? I would not encourage. I mean, if you're there, you come for education, if you come for uh, whatever reason, and you're there to be there, alhamdulillah. But for you to move, I would not encourage that. But again, Canada, in terms of business, in terms of uh, human rights, in terms of you know, civilization, is out there with lillahi um, We are very blessed being in a, in a country like Canada. But if you, you're here, I mean, I'm, try, I'm trying to come here, trying to move here. So stay where you are, mashallah. Tar. You mentioned about uniting the ummah. Sorry, what did I mention? You mentioned the mic, the mic. No, put it closer to you. Oh, you mentioned uh, uniting this ummah together. But we have so many different kind of ideology, manhaj, uh, Salafi, Sufi, uh, all of these. How are we going to get to in one bandwagon? You will never be able to unite everybody. It's, it's not the sunnah of Allah. It will never happen. The messenger of Allah already told us we will be in different sects. Was, we, he forewarned us, he told us that. But he also said, Saddidu wa qaribu. Saddidu wa qaribu. Try to maintain as much as you can. Try to bring people together as much as you can. 
And the best way is to di direct them to the Quran and to the Sunnah of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because if we live in this compartment and we try to create barriers, we will be weak and we will be defeated and we will never be able to move forward. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَأَطِيعُوا اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ وَلَا تَنَازَعُوا فَتَفْشَدُوا وَتَذَبَ رِيحُكُمْ وَاسْبِرُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَ صَابِرِينَ وَأَطِيعُوا اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ وَلَا تَوَلَّوا وَأَنْتُمْ تَسْمَعُونَ وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ قَالُوا سَمِعْنَا وَهُمْ لَا يَسْمَعُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Obey Allah and obey His Messenger. And do not differ with one another, otherwise you would be weakened and your strength will go away. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, obey Allah and His Messenger. And don't be amongst those people who hear this statement and still do whatever they want to do. But the, and they turn away from the deen of Allah. You can never unite everybody on the same exact manhaj. But bring them closer. Bring them closer as much as you can. You know, you can't ask everybody to, you know, grow their beer. You say, this is sunnah, the sunnah is not to touch your beer if you, if you follow that red hajj. Or you say the sunnah is to trim, you know, arm, you know, fist, uh, fist length, length, and so on. So you can't have everybody on the same page. It's, it's challenging. And that's why Ibn Taymiyyah, he used to call everybody Ahl al-Qibla, the people of Qibla, the people of Qibla. So you have people who are not on the manage 100%, don't follow the sunnah of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 100%, but they follow 90%. Try to bring them closer so that you can complete that 10%. If they follow 70%, bring them closer. I keep, keep doing this because there's only one group that will wholeheartedly be following the sunnah of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he said, those are the ones who follow what I am upon and my companions are upon. Now, what are we going to do with the rest of these Muslims? You know, we got to learn how to come together, try to minimize the differences as much as we can. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who guides. Not me, not you, no one else. And that's how Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to do with the Sahaba, he used to deal with them based on their understanding and then based on their ibadat, he also used to judge them. Wallahu a'la wa'ala. Sisters, question from the sisters. Yes, Sister Hafsa. Yes, Sister uh, we came to know that most of the Western they are coming to Islam. Well, why did the Muslim are leaving Islam? Understand that non-Muslims are coming to Islam. Why are Muslims leaving Islam? Umar bin Khattab used to say, Yusuf, I said, um, this deen would be destroyed one straw at a time by people who were born into Islam and never experienced Jahiliyyah. I'm saying this as an introduction to my answer. The people who are leaving Islam never understood Islam correctly. They're ignorant. I sat with almost, I would say, hundreds of young people and I asked them, what do you, do you know Islam? And they would all say, yes. I know Islam, I studied Islam, I understood Islam, I read about it, and I'm, I chose to leave Islam. And then you ask them, what do you know about Islam? Well, I say, I, I, I know Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, I can read the Fatiha, I can, but that's not all Islam. You only memorize a little bit about, of the Quran, and now you think you know Islam. Or they were answered and they said, you know, I want to Mal'ama, or I want to Duxi, or I want to Quran school, and I know what the, what the teachers are teaching. So he's judging Islam based on little things that he saw here and there. The reality of these young people is they don't know Islam. Because anyone who knows Islam would never leave Islam. But they thought they know Islam. 
A lot of young lady who left Islam, they left because they adopted the feminist ideas about women. And they say, look, Islam abuses women. And they only got their sources from one source. They got the information from one source, and that is the professor who's teaching her this. So she thinks whatever this lady is saying is the final authority in Islam. But subhanAllah, if these children give you a chance and you sit with them and you answer their questions, then a lot of them will say, now I understand Islam. See, I was one of the people. Sheikh, I hope Sheikh Hussein, you will not disown me after this, inshallah. You know, I was one of the people who had doubts about Islam when I was in grade 9. Because I was raised in Saudi. and Saudi, everything is good. We didn't even know madahib. We didn't know there's something called Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi. We only, know, we only knew one thing. Go to the masjid. Pray like the Imam is praying. Read the Quran like your teacher taught you. You know, read the fiqh. Read Kitab al-Tawheed, Usul al-Thalatha. So we just memorize, memorize, memorize. But when I came, and I was all by myself, by the way. When I came, I went to a Christian school, Catholic school. And the teachers, you know, look how they used to do with me. They saw this little African kid coming from Africa because they thought I came from Africa. Who, who is a Muslim. So at school, the teachers used to treat me special way because they want me to like them, which I did. Uh, the, the priest was the librarian of the school. During my break time, the priest used to take care of me. He used to take care of me and, you know, and teach me about Jesus and how Jesus loves me. And how Jesus Christ, you know, is, is, is the one that he, his salvation is with Jesus Christ. You know, when I go home, when I, actually I joined the basketball team. My coach was a Catholic, Italian Catholic coach. So he used to teach me about Christianity. When I go home, I used to live by myself. The church appointed a, a, a person, a preacher to come and be with me. So seven days out of the week, seven days, they being bombarding me with Christianity. And then I, the next time I was like, now who said Islam is the right religion? Who said Islam is the haq? These guys are nice. They are good. They are kind. They're giving me gifts during Christmas, you know, Thanksgiving dinner. They're giving me everything. You know, where are the Muslims? You know, and then they, they create doubts. And I'm just a little kid. Then subhanallah, once, this is what changed my mind. Once the, preach, the priest came to teach as a substitute teacher. And my classmates, they just attacked the preacher or the priest with questions about Catholicism. Why is this? Why Jesus is son of God? How come is this? And I was like, wait, 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 wait a second, wait a second. I had all these questions. You know, wait a second. So Islam is right, alhamdulillah. So that's, and then subhanAllah, next day the teacher said, subhanAllah, I still remember. The teacher came back and she said, you know, I want you guys to write. I still remember Mrs. Reed. She said, I want you to write something about your life. And I said, can I choose anything? And she said, anything. I said, I said, okay, I'm choosing Jesus in Islam. And she said, really? I said, yeah. And she said, okay. She was shocked. So I traveled because I was two and a half hours away from the city of Toronto. So I traveled by bus by fr Friday after school. And then I went to a Jami'i Mosque, the one that I was telling you, Jami'i Mosque. It used to be a church, the Muslim bought it. I went there, and the, book, the bookstore was closed. And as soon as the bookstore opened, and the brother, he pushed the door in, and I'm right behind him. What do I see? A book, green book in front of me, and the title of the book is Jesus in Islam. I bought the book $15, I still remember. I bought the book, I just copied everything. Just copy, you know. 
And I took her to the school to the teacher, and she was shocked. And she said, "Do you believe in Jesus?" And she said, "Yes." Do you believe in Jesus? Yes. Do you believe in Mary? Yes. She can I have a copy of the Quran? And I said, "Wow, I'm a big sheikh now, mashallah. <laughs> I'm giving da'wah." And from there, Subhanallah, it was funny. The next day, I came and said, "Listen, you know, I say to myself, why do I have to pray at home for Dhuhr and Asr? I'm going to pray at school." So I went to the librarian, went to the priest, and I said, uh, "I want to pray." And he said, "Thank Lord." And he just prayed, and he said, "How do you like to pray?" I said, "I want to pray like a Muslim." And he said, "Really?" I said, "Yes." And he said, "Okay, what do you want from me?" I said, "I need space." And he said, "How big?" I said, "Well, you know, not this big." He said, "Is that place good?" We are in the middle of the library. I said, "Yes." So he said, "Okay, go." He thought I'm kidding. I said, "Allahu Akbar." Everybody in the library at the beginning, okay, somebody standing. When I went rukur, some of the guys like, "What is he doing?" And then I went sujood, and it's like where he's going. <laughs> and then everybody, who, the people who was reading, the people who was passing by, they, you know, we, I remember we had a big glass door or window, so anybody who's passing through the hallway can see the library. So the people start coming in and say, "What is he doing? What is he doing?" And they came to me, "Sayid, what are you doing?" I'm not responding. I'm praying, you know, in the salah. What are you doing? Finally, I finished the salah. Next day, I did the same thing. The third day, I came to the library, and the whole school is almost waiting for me to pray. <laughs> Everybody wants to watch. So the the, the priest said, uh, "I'm giving you." He had an office inside. He said, "Can I give you my office? Can you pray inside? <laughs> I want you to hide your prayer from my students." I said yes, so I used to pray inside. So the, my point to answer your question is, the people that are leaving Islam, they don't know Islam. That's the saddest part. But unfortunately, they think they know Islam. They are deceived and they think they know Islam, but they don't know. No. So, okay. The last question from Thank any brothers sisters. Uh, Sheikh, um, in light of the um, topic being minority, and um, now there are uh, a minority group called themselves LGBT, <laughs> who are really um, vocal, and Muslims or people who call themselves Muslims who actually propagate or reinterpret the Quran, saying that you know, oh, this is acceptable, whatever. How do we? And and it's 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 everywhere. It's everywhere now, even here. How do we um, help our children to understand that this is an issue, that it's not okay? Um, so yeah, I don't know if that's a verb. Uh, yeah. That's for Sheikh Hussein, inshallah, to <laughs> Sheikh. You want, she said here. See the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, Kullu mawlud yulad al fitra. Every child is born in a state of innate, natural state. Fitra. Fa'abawah yuhawida. His parents are the one who's making him Yahudi or Christian or anything. Likewise, your child is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When that child was given to you as a gift, that child is pure. Pure here and pure here. He's not corrupted by anything out there. It is you who can direct this child to the right thing. It is you as a parent who can make this child a righteous child or make him a regular Muslim. You know, when the child was given to you as a gift from Allah, didn't know how to cheat, did not know how to lie, did not know how to steal, 
did not know how to curse. It is us and the, and the society that corrupt that child or keeps him on the right path because wurid al fitra. Likewise, when you're teaching your child, not only about this subject, but all subjects, you gotta be careful. You gotta learn how to approach this child based on the age of the child. As the ulama said, children are three, they, they take three different stages. Age from one, or from birth to seven. And there's a method, a methodology you should follow as a parent, how to teach the child from that, from birth to the age, the age of seven. And that is, يقول العلماء من خلال القصص واللعب through stories, uh, through, through play, playful, you know, education. So you can teach your child through stories not to lie, through stories not to, not to steal, through stories to be honest and decent. You can teach your child that through plays. And then they say from 7 to 14, that's when actual education comes. That's when the formal education comes. So what do you do? Whatever you learn, whatever you try to teach him in those seven years, the early seven years, you confirm that by finding sources and foundation for those. And then you take the level, the next level. My point is here, you know, any evil act out there, whether it's drinking, gambling, stealing, all this, you can teach your child at home. And that is one of the best things that we have as a minority. When my children come home and they say, Daddy, why do they have, you know, Christmas? Why, why do they have that tree? Why do they have lights in their houses? I simply tell them, you know, that is their faith, but we have our own. They have their own Eid, we have our own Eid. And I make sure that the day of Eid is a day to remember. They forget about the Christmas day of Christmas Eve, they forget about, you know, Halloween evening, they forget about everything and make sure they celebrate the day of Eid, Eid al-Adha, Eid al-Fitr. So you can always teach your children without using, a, you know, a particular terms and groups. But all evil is, can be taught uh, in, in a different method and all khair can also be taught through different methods. Now. Uh, we are thankful to all the brothers and sisters who participate in the Q&A session. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we know we have a lot of questions to ask, but the LGBT cases is uh, becoming very common everywhere. It can be very sensitive in certain countries, but as Muslims, we all know what is right and what is wrong. So it's our duty to make sure our children have this right understanding and values. What is wrong is wrong. Whoever wants to say whether the Muslim or not yet Muslim, yeah, it don't, no, no matter to us. Anybody can say anything. One is against Allah's command and against the John Prophet. Then we know where we stand. And that's what we have to reinforce the value to our children. When the Prophet start his mission, they are all living in the Muslim minority environment. But never weaken the Prophet's mission or the Sahaba. But the beauty of Islam that was brought by our Prophet is not localized. It's not racial. It's not tribal, but is the universal value that Islam is open for all. That Islam is for everybody, not only belong to one race, one particular tribe. Now this is the universal value that the Prophet has promoted. With the patient that the Prophet has, and the best example that the Prophet has shown, Allah give them victory. Now, if you want to have the same kind of victory, that is the same step we have to follow. Because he's the best way for us to follow. Some brother is saying that the Ummah is so divided. Yet, Allah said, you are divided. We will be divided. The Prophet said, you will be divided to 73 groups. 
when the prophet said that this thing is going to happen, but are you going to be one of them? That reminds us, you must be careful. You must be selective. You must know which group to follow. Allah said to us, And all of Allah showed us two ways. And then the right way and the wrong way. The way to Allah or the way towards the other direction. But then Allah taught us to only ask one way. And we have been asking Allah every day. We all ask the same way. The right way. But then, back to the question of some of the brothers, why Muslim is leaving Islam? Why not yet Muslim is coming to Islam? It's also mentioned in the Quran that this is going to happen. If you don't bother about your deen anymore, you don't value your deen anymore. You are not thankful and grateful anymore. The time will come. Allah will replace you. Allah is going to replace you. It's up to you to choose. You want to be good, you're welcome. You choose not to be. Allah don't need all of us. We need Him. We need His guidance. But what went wrong, it's not that we do not teach our children we did educate them, teach them how to recite Quran, memorize Quran, and teach them how to read the Quran beautifully. But we fail to make them understand the Quran. We never reinforce the value of Islam to them. We only reinforce ritual, ritual, and teach them to be judgmental. That is the problem we are facing. We know the weaknesses that we have. We know how bad our environment. Muslim minority, they have their strength. They also have their issues, their challenges. Muslim majority also have major problems. Yeah, so it go together, you know. It's a package. It now means that you are Muslim majority, then you're okay. You can relax now. Everything that means nafsik, you yourself. That's why Allah make it very clear. What Allah is going to question us, brother and sister, is not about how many groups the Muslim been doing. Allah don't ask you. He asks about you yourself and your family. Yes, thing that you have control. That's why Allah said, "Ya yuhadzina amanuku anfusakum wa ahlikum nar." Or you who believe in Allah. What you have to do, the minimum that we can do is to save ourselves. Don't talk about others first. Where are you now? Are you okay? Your aqidah, okay. Okay, alhamdulillah. Your understanding about your salah is okay. Or you're just praying, everybody is praying. How many of the Muslims who, who establish their prayer? Not just pray, who, has, who know what they are doing in their prayer. You have to ask, you, most of the children, they don't know. You want them to pray, they pray. Then as parents, oh, my children is a praying Muslim. Okay, alhamdulillah, it's good now. It's not like other children playing only, he's a praying Muslim. But he may do all the ritual, but without understanding. There will come a time he will be exposed to another environment. And that's where the challenge comes in. And people will start to corrupt them. And they are weak. Deep inside, they are very weak. It involves, we know because we are engaging to a lot of new Muslim yeah, youngsters, girls, who is telling their parents, I'm not a Muslim anymore. The parents love the children, send them to madrasa in an early age, send them to memorize the Quran, send them to read the Quran, send them to international school. The way we value knowledge today like Islam is not international. Islam is too conservative, too backward. 
We are the one who look down upon Islam. We don't value Islam. We thought that when they go to all this school, they get this higher education and from other people, ah, they are successful children. Yes, you want what children? It's up to you. You choose. You want your children to have dunya and akhirah or only dunya? I share with you a very simple example. What happened in Canada, Alhamdulillah, they have a lot of freedom to practice their deen. But in the same time, you must use a lot of wisdom. Show them the beauty of Islam. Islam is about caring, loving, commitment, about cleanliness, working together, helping each other, respecting the elders, love the young. Islam is about community work. Amal ma'aruf nahi munkar. It's not just zikir, zikir and then dressing and then having beard on it. No. But the way when we talk about Islam, some brother was, they are so divided. Yes. So what do you do? You also want to be divided like that? You learn from what you see. Why they are divided? Because they don't follow the deen. So now you have the choice. Do you want to follow them or you want to follow the deen? Allah will call ask us. He's not going to ask us. Ku anfusakum. Save your soul. That you ask Allah every day, ehdina sirat mustaqim. Follow. And if you want to be safer, don't be by yourself. You know there's so many groups around. But you yourself, as parents sometimes, are not istiqama, are not in a jama'ah. How are you going to save your children? Because your children is not in a good jama'ah. They're exposed to a lot of things that you allow them to expose. But now you feel okay because you are still there. But wallahi, brother and sister, what I'm experiencing lately, I feel very sad inside. These are children who was with us from the day they were born. But after some time when they leave us, not because they leave us, it's the parent who left us. And when the parent don't come, of course the children don't come anymore. That's what happened. Now they are telling their parents, I'm no more Muslim. Alhamdulillah, some parents brought them back. Slowly we are trying to help them. And now they are starting to rethink again. But why must you let that thing happen? That's why the Prophet said, Alaykum bil jama'ah, jama'ah rahma, firqa azab. Jamaah, a lot of blessing because there will be somebody who monitor, help you. You don't have the time to talk. Somebody is there to talk to your children. Somebody is there to comfort your children, make them feel good. As a Muslim, be proud as a Muslim. Where you may overlook. Firqa azab. Very true what the Prophet said. When you get out from the Jamaah, you are just waiting for trouble. We don't know when. But we thought it's okay. No, no. Don't think that it's okay. When you go against Allah's command and you go against the system of jama'ah, it's a sign that you are going towards self-destruction. Now your students have different environments. May Allah save all of us from the great challenges. But it's going to come again. But how did the Prophet and the companions, like Ibn Masud always say, if you want to follow anybody, brother and sister, don't follow the living, following the dead people. Why? Why must they follow the dead one? People are dead. How can you follow them? How they end their life, how they gone through all the struggle and challenges, they never fail Allah. They love the Prophet, so not only when the Prophet was alive, 
even after the Prophet passed away, his sunnah is being followed very closely. And they always stick in the jama'ah. That is important. It's the karma. Be consistent. consistent. Inna lazina qalu rabbun Allah thumma staqamu. You believe in Allah, it's okay. Alhamdulillah. A lot of people believe in Allah. Are you istiqamah? No. Are you committed? No. And you want the best. May Allah help all of us, inshallah. Once again, we'd like to thank. <laughs> yeah. So I said, Raghir came all the way under the invitation of uh, Brother Farid Dabakon for the three straight paths. Some of the scholars coming in soon. May Allah Rabbul Alameen also make their journey a safe one. It's not easy. Certain question that you ask, it's not easy for them to answer. But most of the questions being answered, Alhamdulillah. But some, you feel, why, why he is not answering? Then you know. Next time, when you ask something and the person is trying to, any scholars, is trying to go a different direction, inshallah. People of knowledge will understand. People who don't really have knowledge, and they say, why he's not answering my question? Yeah, he has answered the question without yeah, mentioning anything by telling us we have to educate our children. What is right is right. What is wrong is wrong. What people want to say, let them say. You cannot stop them from saying. Whether Muslim or not Muslim. Now you can see in the video clip, you know, they are saying, you know, I'm a Muslim, I'm wearing hijab, I'm eating nasi lemak with pork. So, dog, what are you going to do? Can you eat pork? You can, of course, it's a meat. It's another meat, of course, it's haram. It's just another meat. Even the wear who hijab say, this is tasty. Only we know it's haram. So we don't. But these people, they, they are lost. They thought that last time they said, don't eat, don't eat, it's dirty, but the, 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 the pig that they saw is clean one, organic one. What are you going to tell them? Yeah. And then uh, maybe it's haram because they don't slaughter. This one is, they slaughter. In the Islamic way. Why are you going to tell? See, because of lack of understanding. Majority of the Muslim brothers and sisters today, I feel sad when they learn and then they thought they understand. They thought they understood a lot of what they've learned now. When I look at their lifestyle and look how they communicate, I can feel that they don't really have deep understanding. The companion, Alhamdulillah. They don't have a lot of classes like all of you. They don't have a lot of activities like all of you. Have time to attend the A class, the B class, the C class. But they are understanding about the deen very deep. This makes them strong inside. We are, we are so active in here and there. But our understanding is very, very and weak. You want to know whether you're weak or not? You ask yourself, how long you have been learning? What have you done with the knowledge that you have learned? How many hadiths you have memorized? You ask yourself. And how many people that you have conveyed the message of Islam to? Have you engaged yourself with the people you don't? Then how are you going to do that? You have to come back. You have to ask. You have to learn. You have to have a good teacher to refer to. One of the signs of something that is trained going to happen to this Ummah. Al-alim gharibum. 
فی ما بین قوم لا يسمعون الیه When you have a scholar close to you and you don't care, you don't bother about your scholar. You thought that you are also a scholar now. Grief, strain is happening. Wherever you go, you must be thankful to Allah that we all have been guided. We have a jama'at. We must be consistent. We must be committed. And we move together. Inshallah. Inna Allah la yughayru ma bi qawmin hatta yughayru ma bi anfusim. Allah will never change our condition, brother and sister. I don't blame him. He make it very clear. He will never change your condition until you want to change. Do you want to change, brother and sister? Yes. You see, I only hear a few voices. Yes, two or three here and there. The rest don't know what to say, you know. Yes or no? Yeah, la, okay, la. Expression. You know? We are very weak in to, even to express ourselves. How can we do that one? When we are very weak to express our feeling. If you love somebody, do you tell him, I love you? Or when he's going to die? You know, I love you so much. Oh, you love me to die. Eh? That's why you tell me that you love me when I'm dying. You must learn how to express yourself. Islam is about expression. Feel good about yourself. And then talk to people. Insha. I've taken a lot of time, Rajin. You know, more than. Yeah. May Allah bless us. May Allah protect all the scholars who are coming here to share their knowledge with all of us. And uh, may Allah also yeah, reward them kindly. And also reward Brother Farid Dawah Khandal, who have been very active thinking of how to organize and get the right scholar to come and share their knowledge with the Muslim wherever they are, to understand the importance of following the Sunnah of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Amin ya Rabbil Alamin. Wa bilay tawfiq wa raqrida. I want to once again, we thank all of you who are here tonight, especially our guest speaker. So the little that you have learned, please remember. And if what we say is okay, Alhamdulillah. If you say not okay, also Alhamdulillah. Because we have done our duty. <laughs> we have conveyed the most. Our duty, وَمَا عَلَيْنَا إِلَّا الْبَلَى وَاللَّهُ يَحْدِي مَا يَشَاءُ Is to convey to you. وَبِلَا تَوْفِقِي وَرَقْرِدَا وَنَّا وَالْحَمْدِ لَبْلَانِ سُبْحَانَكَ اللَّهُمْ وَبِحَمْدِكَ أَشْهَدُ وَاللَّهِ إِلَّا أَنْتَ اسْتَغْفِرُكَ وَتُوبُ إِلَيْهِ السَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ وَبَرَكَات